we are with Sarah McAllister the day after the IWF Fuels Conference in Albuquerque. And Sarah was honored with an award uh, a couple of days ago. She was given the IWF Award for an Early Career in Fire Science. So what did it feel to get that award, Sarah? Well, total shock. I had no idea it was coming. Huh? And you know, when they're reading off all my accomplishments, I was unsure that it was even me in the first place. So uh, just, yeah, surprise. Um, I said I was, I was really glad I was done eating lunch at the time because I would, probably would have choked on my food. <laughs> so tell me about your life so far. What was it like? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Reno, Nevada. Um, went to uh, school there all the way through my undergrad. Went to the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, from there, I went to UC Berkeley for grad school, where I did my master's and my PhD in mechanical engineering. And that's where I actually got started in doing fire. Um, my PhD dissertation was actually looking at fire in spacecraft. Um, but as part of the PhD program there, we have to take classes outside of the engineering department. So I ended up taking some forestry classes with uh, Professor Scott Stevens there. And uh, that's how I really got sucked into wildland fire. And, um, I, yeah, so I guess the rest is history. I, um, my, my work with Scott Stevens led to my getting a job at, um, in the Forest Service with Mark Finney at, at the Missoula Fire Lab, and I've been there for nearly 10 years. So I am a research mechanical engineer, and I, I tell people I basically light things on fire for a living, um, but I, I study how fire behaves, um, primarily in the lab setting. We're looking at how heat is transferred, what's going on with the fluid dynamic flow, how things ignite, how things burn, on a very basic physics level, physics level, so that we can then kind of understand a little bit better how it works. What do you like best about your job? Oh, probably the fact that I can light things on fire for a living. <laughs> a couple of days ago during the conference, uh, there was a panel about women in fire. Uh, six or eight women it was a Simon cast from both Sydney, Australia, and here at Albuquerque, and they talked about what it was like to be a woman in a male-dominated um, field. As a, a female engineer, I can very much relate about that. You know, I often, in my classes in undergrad, I mean, there would be maybe two or three of us in a class of 100. Um, and all the way through, I mean, I go to a lot of engineering conferences still, not just the IAWF ones. Um, where you know you'll, you'll be sitting in a whole room full of hundreds of people and there's maybe five women so um, I can very much relate to that <laughs> and you know everybody is um, just even the last few years become very conscious of it and are trying to to kind of remedy the situation and try to figure out how we can get more women involved and I think it's about time. <laughs> Did you ever feel like you were under a microscope and you couldn't really screw up at all that you had to be perfect all the time because you were because of your gender, you stood out so much? Well, you know, it's hard to say if it was entirely because of my feelings of what other people thought of me or if it was my feelings of myself, because I did put a lot of pressure on myself um, to be perfect and to, you know, get straight A's in school and everything. So it's hard to say where that motivation was coming from, but I definitely kind of had that drive for sure. Have you ever had a mentor in your professional life? You know, I, I have had a lot of people that I have um, very much looked up to and that have, I feel, um, looked out for me as well. Um, you know, and I have, I have several. I think most of them ended up nominating me for that award. So it was, uh, I feel really lucky I had to be surrounded by a lot of really great people. Like my PhD advisor from UC Berkeley um, is, a, is a fantastic man. And he um, has always really supported me. And, um, and he's very well respected in the field. Um, there's other professors, um, Dr. Kozo Saito, um, Arno Truve from the University of Maryland. Um, those are all people come to mind that people um, that have really, I mean, there's been others for sure, but have really like looked out for me and have given me opportunities. Have you ever been a mentor yourself or would you consider? Being oh, I would one? definitely consider being one. Um, you know, especially as a woman in the field, it's like it's not very often that, you um, that there are people um, succeeding and you know being visible and I uh, yeah I'd be very happy to to mentor somebody. <laughs> what would you tell someone that's starting out in their career if they wanted to follow in your footsteps? 
don't be afraid to dive in. I mean, a lot of people are hesitant about, you know, like, ooh, I'm not the perfect fit for this, or, you know, I'm, I might struggle a little bit with it, but, you know, don't worry. Everybody has those fears, and nobody's going to be perfect. So just go ahead and do it. Uh, don't be afraid. And don't let anybody, like, say anything that gets you down. One of your more interesting projects you've been working on was south of the equator. Could you tell us how that came about and what you actually did down there? Ah, yes. Yeah. So um, one of my coworkers, Mark Finney, um, he's another great uh, mentor of mine. And uh, he was actually um, had a, coordinated some work down with um, Scion, which is the New Zealand forestry research uh, group down there. And they, um, they wrote a grant to work with the, the government down there for us to come down and do some field work to help bolster and scale up what we're doing in the lab. Um, so we've been down um, once already bef uh, before last year, and then we have a couple more burns planned where we're um, scaling up our lab-based experiments and doing a bunch of um, co highly concentrated field measurements to, to understand how heat is transferred and fire spread and um, try, to, try, try to make sure that what we're doing in the lab actually makes sense in the real world. <laughs> Uh, so, so far we've done wheat stubble, um, well, I guess technically it's grain stubble because there was wheat, barley, and triticale that we burned in. Um, all seemed to be pretty similar once it was harvested. Uh, and so that was our first step, was kind of the most simple, most homogeneous fuel. And then we're going to move to doing what they call gorse. It's a very th spiny, um, really gross, dense um, shrub that grows down there and it's kind of taking over. and it's. Uh, it's invasive and they don't want it there, so um, we're going to burn some of it. And then we're eventually going to graduate to doing crown fires. They have, uh, also they have some invasive trees down there, which, is, which are actually lodgepole pine and Douglas fir that obviously don't belong there, but they're kind of taking over their valleys. And uh, again, they don't want them there, so we, they're allowing us to burn them, so we're going to get some pretty cool crown fires out of it, I hope. So, so we're going to take more trips down to New Zealand, huh? And at least two more. Yeah, <laughs> I know, it's tough. What other research have you been involved in? So I do a lot of research um, looking at how things ignite. Um, in particular, sort of a curious question is what's going on with live fuels? Um, you know, they're, you know, most of their weight is in water. Um, in fact, like, you know, when you say a live fuel has 100% moisture content, that means it has more mass of water in it than it has, you know, actual dry matter in it, right? So the question is, is how could something that's mostly water actually ignite and burn and carry some of our most intense, you know, unpredictable fires like in crown fires. So that's kind of a, a passion of mine is to try to kind of tease out what's going on with live fuels. But I've also been doing a lot of work looking at how fuel beds burn. Um, so I do a lot of experiments with uh, these things called wood cribs. So they're just ordered piles of sticks. Um, and the idea is just to be able to look at how every little factor, how the stick thickness, how they were arranged, you know, what things like wind and moisture content do to how quickly a fuel bed will burn under a certain condition. So. Do you like your job? I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> I understand you're staying after the conference a couple more days in order to go towards a particular goal. What's yeah. up with that? Um, so I have a, a silly um, life goal of mine to run a race in every state, half marathon or longer. Um, so I'm staying until Sunday to get New Mexico off of my state list. Doesn't sound too silly. Well, you know, it's, it keeps me motivated. I mean, it's, it's hard to run year round in Missoula and having this, you know, like looming, oh, I could travel at any moment and, you know, get another state off my list. So it makes me run all year. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs>